rock and roll died of its own weight in a way. The folk scene was happening, the village was just this sort of swamp of clubs and coffee houses. The guitar was like a magnet, you know, it could draw people in. People did get influenced by the romantic idea of a guitar and a singer and sing a sad song. There were all these little factions. There were some people that were just into blues, some people that were just into bluegrass, some people that were just into the protest part of it. How could you beat an era like that? I mean, it was just a great scene and had an energy all its own that's seldom been repeated. The thing about Dylan is that Dylan kind of signified a sea change and all of a sudden, you wrote your own songs. It was just sort of like automatic, as opposed to no one even thought of doing that. And then suddenly, like, everyone didn't, didn't really think of doing that. It's thought, that's what you do. He changed everything. He's astonishingly better than almost everything else around him. When he started writing, that, that was a big paradigm shift right there. The bar was then set for, for good songwriting way, way before it was here, then it was here. American folk music a broad, loosely defined term covering a range of genres derived from European and African musical forms and brought to the country by settlers of various nationalities. Ballads, hymns, songs and instrumental styles passed on through the generations by an oral tradition, yet constantly evolving. This music was the product of the lower classes, workers, peasants and slaves. By the early 20th century, while some genres had become established in popular culture, others had remained obscure and these caught the attention of folklorists and archivists looking to study and catalogue traditional musical forms. New advances in recording technology enabled these academics to capture the sounds of America's neglected communities, and discoveries such as Lead Belly in 1933 by father and son folklorists John and Alan Lomax brought this music to a wide audience. And in an America wading through the Great Depression, the most receptive audience to the traditional sounds of folk music were the leftists who championed these forms that had emanated from the lowest strata of society and which had endured without the interference of commercial interests. By the late 1930s, Lead Belly himself was transformed into a heroic figure by the Communist Party of the USA, who were growing considerably at the time, and folk music itself soon became political. There were a lot of things wrong with the Communist Party USA, but the folk movement was not one of them. It had its things wrong with the CPUSA problems, for sure. It was ideological, it was sentimental, it was uh, uh, moralistic in a way that wasn't gonna convince anybody who didn't already agree with you. All of that stuff. Nevertheless, it was a brilliant creation. It was a creation, the notion of folk music. And it was created primarily, not entirely, by Communist Party intellectuals in the 30s. In 1940, New York became the center of activity for an emerging folk scene. Here, the leading lights of the movement were establishing its political values while reviving and reassessing its musical parts. Alongside singer, songwriter and activist Josh White, Lead Belly and his manager Alan Lomax were two white musicians, the young middle-class New York native Pete Seeger and a singer and songwriter from Oklahoma, Woody Guthrie. These two artists in particular would become pioneering figures in the redefinition of American folk, penning their own material in the mold of the traditional songs that had inspired them and using the music itself as a vessel for political commentary. They set the template for the artists who would follow in their wake. Pete and Woody meant the world to us. I mean, they were, um, at, least, at least to me, I mean, I willingly followed the trail that they had blazed. I mean, I've always said that uh, if it hadn't been for Pete Seeger, there wouldn't have been a folk music revival, anything approaching what, what actually happened. And Pete really blazed the trail. I 
began writing songs because of Woody Guthrie and Pete Seeger. I wanted to write songs that sounded like the songs that Woody wrote, except I wanted to try to make them my songs and my time, my, my era. This radical faction of folk music emanating from New York became muted after the end of the Second World War, with fascism apparently defeated and a new enemy emerging, communism. While Guthrie suffered declining health, Seeger formed the Weavers, and this group's less overtly political output struck a chord with the public and propelled them into the mainstream. Yet by the mid-1950s, both the Red Scare and the Cold War were escalating, and the anti-communist witch hunts led by Senator Joe McCarthy and the House Un-American Activities Committee put an end to the Weavers and derailed Pete Seeger's career. Folk refused to die, however, with the release of filmmaker Harry Smith's landmark compilation Anthology of American Folk Music in 1952, introducing obscure recordings from the late 20s and early 30s to a receptive, wider audience and popular group the Kingston Trio emerging as one of the most commercially successful acts in America towards the end of the decade. Despite the brief revolution brought into popular music by rock and roll in the mid-50s, as the country entered the 1960s, a new generation of musicians began looking to the past once again, and word spread of a folk revival. You know, it's seen as this efflorescence, but I actually see it as the gathering storm that begins with Harry Smith, run through the fact that there were folk hits uh, in, the, in the late 50s, like the Tarriers, three uh, Greenwich Village folkies who had a big hit with Banana Boat Song, which was then covered by Harry Belafonte, who was not without his folk connections either. I see, see it myself as an organic process. And the first great efflorescence of rock and roll, which begins, say, with Maybelline in September of 55, and runs pretty strong through 58, does in fact really begin to tail off between 59 and 62. Not as bad as in myth, but nevertheless in a real way so that people are just the right age to turn from the music they like when they were a little younger. It's getting worse, they have new ideas, and, and they pick up on what was already in the air and in their own culture. About that time, we were starting to pick up on the Smithsonian uh, anthology. People started listening to these old recordings and started finding that these amazing artists, mostly blues artists, but also country artists and Appalachian artists, were not just these mythical figures that were coming to us on these scratchy recordings through the mists of time, but they were actually quite alive and well, most of them. But there was another component to the folk music scene. I would say it started with people like Pete Seeger and Woody Guthrie. There was a sort of a branch of folk music that was mostly interested in songs of social relevance and of course all the wonderful songs that Woody Guthrie had written. So there were a lot of different factions. It wasn't just blues or Appalachian or bluegrass. It was, it was everything all at once. This growing interest in folk music spread to Minnesota. Young Robert Zimmerman, whose first band had performed Little Richard numbers at their high school in the large mining town of Hibbing, was one of many to grow disenchanted by the commercialization of rock and roll and to subsequently be drawn to the earthier sounds offered by artists from the recent past. Dylan growing up in the 1950s, like uh, almost every American kid, his music is not folk music, it's, it's rock and roll and Elvis Presley and Little Richard. Uh, I, I mean, I suppose if you're Arlo Guthrie, then uh, it, it might be different, but uh, you'd be quite an unusual teenager to... Uh, be into folk music, uh, I think, uh, uh, at that age. There's a story, in fact, that he was given some old Lead Belly 78s on his graduation, and that was possibly his first introduction to, to this music, and he started learning and playing those songs. But the folk music epiphany really comes when he goes to college in the twin cities of Minneapolis and St. Paul, where he's a very poor attender 
of uh, lectures and a very assiduous attender of the uh, folk clubs and coffee houses in Dinky Town, the uh, sort of bohemian district next to the to the campus. And uh, I think it was probably a girlfriend gave him his first uh, Woody Guthrie recordings. And he's transfixed. He describes this far more eloquently than I ever could in Chronicles, when he describes the moment he first hears Woody Guthrie as uh, like a heavy anchor dropping into the deep waters of a harbor. I ain't got no home, I'm just a roaming round. Just a wandering worker, I go from town to town. And the police make it hard wherever I may go. And I ain't got no home in this world anymore. The Guthrie obsession grows and grows uh, until the point where he feels uh, he's, he's ready to make the road trip to, to New York and seek the great man out. Zimmerman, now going by the stage name Bob Dylan, left Minneapolis in December 1960, having outgrown the local scene in Dinkytown, and after a brief stay in Chicago, finally arrived in Manhattan on January the 24th, 1961. Ever since the early 1940s, when Pete Seeger, Lead Belly, Josh White and Woody Guthrie had first congregated there, the city had remained the focal point of the folk world, and Dylan was just one of many artists drawn there from all across the US. It was a very romantic thing to come to New York. This was the place where the beats were. This was the place so many people were. Jackson Pollock worked there. All the abstract expressionists worked there. I mean, New York was it, of course. And um, San Francisco was very interesting, but it wasn't really it. It didn't have the gravitas uh, that New York did, or the, the history. It wasn't as big. It didn't have the energy. It wasn't quite the same. New York was the most important, like Sinatra said, you know, if you make it in New York, you can make it anywhere. And uh, it was true then, and it's probably true now. And the district of Manhattan that Dylan gravitated to was Greenwich Village, the artistic and bohemian hub of the city. There's nowhere else for him to go but the village, where, where there's nothing available. It was all in, the, in that area. The village was... Uh, place you'd come to New York that's had its own sense of life, its own acceptance of life, style of life, and you'd find anything that seemed to be against the, the normal of life in the village and accepted by it. I was one of the few people that was on that scene that was actually born and raised there, John Sebastian and my old buddy John Hammond being the only other two I know that I can think of. And as a very little girl, I remember the village was, it had a very strong uh, Italian community. There was a very strong Ital Italian presence there. There were some neighborhoods that were Irish, first generation Irish, first generation Italian. But the other main um, population of the village was made up of all sorts of artists, musicians, dancers. I mean, I think from the early 1900s, it was a mecca for free spirits and free thinking people of all kinds. It was even the first place I can think of where people could openly be gay. So it was naturally, it became the epicenter for all things hip. And that, that was from the 1900s, early 1900s to the period in the early 60s that we're talking about. On the night of his arrival, Dylan stumbled upon the Café Wa, a small venue known to the local musicians as a basket house, where donations from the audience were collected at the end of a set. Appearing on stage that very night as part of an open mic show, or Hootenanny, across the following week, the young singer accustomed himself to the various clubs and cafes that made up the village folk circuit. The village was just this sort of swamp of clubs um, that catered to tourists sometimes, catered to the locals. They were like coffee houses that didn't have cabaret licenses, so anything that happened entertainment-wise was had to be for free. First off, there were the basket passing houses. Uh, that was the lowest level. 
um, which are most of them. And then there are the places that actually paid something, like uh, the Bitter End and the Gaslight and a Gritty Spoke City, but most places were basket passing houses. The idea of a basket house was none of the club owners paid you to play. You would walk in with your instruments, play a set. I mean, you had to be good enough. I mean, not just anybody could do it. Uh, and then pass a bread basket around and people would fill it with money. Like maybe on a great Saturday night, you might get seven bucks worth of change in there. Then you'd pack up and go to the next one. And on that same circuit were John Hammond, Richie Havens, Jose Feliciano, John Sebastian, and various incarnations of different groups he had. All of us did it. And we would have hoot nannies on Saturday nights in a, I remember, I think it was a room at the YMCA on 23rd Street. Pete Seeger was often the MC. People like Reverend Gary Davis would be there, and my friend John Harold and some of the Greenbrier boys, various people, and we'd all sit in a big circle and each sing some songs and uh, sing some songs together, and it, it, it was all like one scene. The Hoot Nannies were most important. They were, and they were also called wingdings. They were places where people got together, and uh, they were great incubation points, and people came to them, it was very vibrant, and people uh, were honing their skills. And uh, not just the Hootenannies, but there was Washington Square Park. That was a great gathering place every Sunday. And uh, there was the fountain, and people came around. The uh, people were singing songs and playing their guitars and banjos and uh, exchanging, you know, swapping songs, like, uh, whatever. And people were coming from all over, from all over the world. And everyone knew that Washington Square was the place to be. While keen to establish himself within this new, thriving environment, Dylan also had another priority. 30 miles west of Greenwich Village, Woody Guthrie was interned at Greystone Park State Hospital in New Jersey, suffering from Huntington's disease. Since his introduction to Guthrie's work, Dylan, like fellow Greenwich Village musician Rambling Jack Elliott, had begun to imitate not only the musical style, but also the mannerisms of the ailing older artist. And his itinerant non-conformist lifestyle and ragged persona had proven inspirational. Over the following year, the young folk singer from Hibbing, Minnesota, was a regular visitor at Guthrie's bedside, and the pair became close friends. He came looking for Woody Guthrie. As it didn't come looking for Pete Seeger. Woody struck a lot of people for his independent style, which I assume the younger people of that generation try to emulate the independence and the, the willingness to go a different way than the normal way and breaking away from family ties, living part hobo, just never getting down to a trade or, or a job. And it was a great experiment. This little light of mine. People like Pete Seeger were very radical politically and of course had been through the whole McCarthyite era, but they were at the same time very respectable, uh, very bourgeois, if you like, um, earnest uh, 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 about their causes and about their music. Guthrie and his followers, like Rambling Jack Elliot, represented a different strand of the folk tradition, which was much earthier that was uh, closer to the common people, for want of a, 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 a better phrase. And, uh, you know, of course, Guthrie took to the road and uh, was a, a, a rambling, gambling man who, who rode the rails. There's that outlaw quality to it. So that strand of folk music is probably far more attractive to teenagers steeped in 50s rock and roll than, than the rather serious, dare I say, po-faced Pete Seeger approach to, to the music. Back in 1927, I had a little farm and I called that heaven. Well, the price is up and the rain come down and I hauled my crops all in the town. I got the money, bought clothes and groceries, fed the kids and raised the family. 
Rain quit and the wind got high and a black hole dust storm filled the sky and I swapped my farm for a Ford machine and I poured it full of this gas eileen and I started rocking and rolling over the mountains out towards the old peach bowl. <laughs> Dylan was quite genuine in his love and admiration for Woody Guthrie. I mean, it's not a case of him cynically trying to ride on Guthrie's coattails. He goes out to the hospital and visits him, and, uh, you know, I think he's, he's, he's genuinely in awe of the man. But there's no doubt that because Guthrie warmed to Dylan and took him as a, a kind of unofficial protégé in a way, that this helped Dylan enormously back in Greenwich Village. There's a story that when Dylan first visited Guthrie in hospital, Woody gave him um, a card which said on it, I'm not dead yet. And uh, Dylan went flashing this all around uh, um, uh, Greenwich Village. So, you know, he, 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 he literally was carrying Woody Guthrie's calling card. So, yeah, it was an enormous help to him to have the support of such an influential figure. That said, you know, I mean, he'd have, he'd have made it anyway. It might just have taken him a little bit longer. Having performed on the Greenwich Village circuit, albeit briefly, and having established contact with his musical hero, within the first two weeks of his arrival in New York, Dylan also headed to Izzy Young's Folklore Centre, a small shop that offered both materials for study and a gathering place for the local folk artists. It started off as a bookstore selling folk music books, but also sold records and music instruments. And then this wonderful guy, Izzy Young, who put it together, he also had little store concerts. So it was really a center. Every time one of these people came in from out of town, the first place they'd go would be to the Folklore Center, and you could find out what's going on. Now, just a half a block away was all these little clubs, coffee houses and so on. But I think what was going on in the Folklore Center was, at least for me, was the center of it because you could look at records from all over the country, you could look at books, old books, song books, photographs of singers, there'd be instruments hanging on the wall, and other musicians would come in there. Anybody could come into my store. I would lend books to people. I had records in the store for all the new folk music records, and I had a, a copy of each one. And I still remember uh, people would look at one or two but the person that looked through every damn record I had was Bob Dylan. <laughs> and I didn't know him from nobody. He just walked in the store one day. He knew what he was doing long before he came to New York City. It's a lot of baloney that, oh, I come to New York City, wow, wow, things are happening all over, wow, wow. But he was ambitious long before he came to New York. He was borrowing records from all his friends and not returning them and you know things like that. So he was listening to every fucking thing he could listen to. And my place was the place where he could relax. By February 1961, Dylan was performing regularly at the Café Noir, the Commons and the Gaslight, growing in confidence within this new and more competitive environment. Yet the larger upmarket venues such as Gerdy's Folk City, the Limelight and the Village Gate remained off limits. Dylan's act not yet refined enough to gain him access to the top tier of the village circuit. He approached me for an audition, and I said, OK. I uh, took him to a coffee shop that opened at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, it was called a caricature. There was caricatures all over uh, this coffee house. And there was a woman who had a full-time job earlier, and she opened at 5 o'clock, and so we went over there. It was, it was empty and quiet and so, and he performed a few songs. I must tell you personally, I wasn't impressed. And the reason is, you know, I said, you know, I, I know Woody Guthrie, I, I like his stuff, and Jack Elliott was around doing that stuff, and I said, and besides, I wasn't too crazy about that sound, you know. I, I, know, I know it wasn't his natural sound, you know. He wasn't an okie. <laughs> so um, I, I just wasn't impressed at that point. And besides, <clears throat> I didn't know at that point, early in that point, how much it would help me in my place, the Village Gate, to put such a performer in. Um, I did take unknowns, but there wasn't that much of an emphasis 
for me to take him on at that point. Yet where some of the older guard saw only another Woody Guthrie imitator, other young artists on the village scene quickly took notice of this new arrival and were very aware that Dylan offered something new. The first time I saw him in late 61 at, at Hoot Night on Monday, his phrasing obviously was part a total grasp on traditional plus rock and roll. And I'd considered like, you know, rock and roll, which I adored, and folk music, which I adored, these, you know, never the, never the twain shall meet, they're, 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 they're two, one, one, one is from the mountain, one is the sea, they can never possibly, possibly find happiness together. And Dylan had like put them together. I'm not talking about Dylan going electric in 65, I'm talking about his like, like, like singing, his phrasing. And I realized that these two disparate, you know, like, like loves of mine were actually capable of being a singularity, which blew my mind. I mean, like, like the guy, I mean, like, I thought, like, that guy can, that guy can really sing. He can, you know, like, you know, Dylan can't sing. I mean, what? <laughs> you know? Dylan quickly progressed on a scene that was itself blooming. Having been accepted into the circles surrounding prominent members of the folk establishment through his friendship with Guthrie, including Pete Seeger, Alan Lomax, and Jack Elliott, he also took up with his contemporaries on the scene. These fellow developing musicians, Marx Balestra, Richard Farina, and Dave Van Ronk, among many others, provided not only a close-knit social group, but also a well of musical ideas and independently discovered material, which Dylan would actively absorb. By April, he secured a supporting slot opening for John Lee Hooker at Gerdes Folk City, and by May, he began to incorporate two of his own early compositions into his sets. Still seen as only one of a number of budding folk singers, however, Dylan pressed the New York Times folk critic Robert Shelton to review one of his shows, keen to rise to greater prominence. When Shelton finally agreed, the resultant review, published on the 29th of September, 1961, immediately established Dylan as an artist to watch. The New York Times was an immensely powerful newspaper and Shelton was the folk music critic. I mean, he knew all the, all, not just the folkies, I mean, he'd, he'd, he'd know Woody Allen and he'd watch gigs by, by Bill Cosby in Greenwich Village. He had really had his finger on the pulse, um, was respected, was, was by all accounts pretty incorruptible. I mean, you know, he, he, he reviewed straight down the line. And I don't think you can underestimate the impact that Robert Shelton's review of Bob Dylan had when it appeared in the New York Times. I mean, this put him so far ahead of his contemporaries. I mean, the fact that the New York Times had a designated folk critic at this point tells you how booming the, the, the folk revival is. Um, and I think Shelton recognised that uh, Dylan was something quite different. This was not the Kingston Trio and Peter, Paul and Mary. It wasn't even Joan Byers and Odetta. It was coming from, from somewhere else completely. People started taking notice of him. Robert Shelton did this killer article on him in the New York Times. And, and that was the first time we had a sense of there was some that some of us might rise to anything above hootenanny status or just sitting around jamming at somebody's house or whatever. And then, of course, by then, Joan Baez, who was part of the Boston contingent of folk music, which was a very healthy scene in and of itself, she had a record out. Odetta had a, an album out by now. So we were starting to get a glimmer that this could go somewhere beyond the living room or, or Gertie's on a Monday night. Dylan himself was soon to have an album of his own. Before the Shelton article had been published, the young folk singer had encountered Columbia Records producer and talent scout John Hammond at a recording session for fellow village artist Carolyn Hester. On October the 26th, 1961, nine months after his arrival in New York, Dylan was offered a contract with Columbia. Yet the Shelton article and his signing to a major label didn't propel the singer to the top of the village scene overnight. In autumn 61, Izzy Young, the owner of the Folklore Center, had offered to step in as Dylan's makeshift promoter. Yet his attempts to launch the artist as a major draw in his own right proved fruitless. There would be in my store uh, two, three, four, five, six musicians there all the time. So then I could see, hey, this guy's really good, she's terrific, I could put a concert with them. So I had luxury, I could choose what I wanted, where the clubs in the village they had to wait till somebody could get 200 people or 400 people. And so uh, I was so sure 
that Bob Dylan would fill up a theater, the small theater in, in Carnegie Hall. And I said, let's do a concert. I was blowing my head off. I took an ad in the paper. I had a newsletter writing it. I was telling everyone, this is the best I've ever heard in my life. I would have bet a million dollars to one that that place is going to be packed up. Well, there were some 300 seats, or 320 or 280, something like that, about 300. And 52 people came. And 300 people remember the concert now. <laughs> Shortly after this show, Dylan entered Columbia Studios to record his self-titled debut. Now keen to distance himself from familiar criticisms of being imitative, the young musician decided to abandon his repertoire of Guthrie songs and tackle folk standards and traditionals, some of which he had appropriated from his peers. Although the LP would not prove a commercial success, it nevertheless provided evidence that even at this early stage, Dylan represented something new and original in a scene that was so bound up in tradition. Well, 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 so I can die easy. Well, well, well. Well, well, Dylan's first album is an incredible record for a 20-year-old to make. And you look at the face staring out at you from the cover, this baby face, ingenue, you know, and then you listen to this white blues singer inside the record. Uh, and, I, you know, I mean, it's a record that's about Dylan the performer, really, because there are only two of his own compositions on it. But what a performer he is. I am a man of constant sorrow. I've seen trouble all my days I say goodbye to Colorado Where I was born and partly raised If you listen to that record now, I mean, he was doing pretty traditional folk stuff. You know, there was a lot of humor in it, though, and there was you know, a sense of an individual personality emerging, which was something that, you know, in a certain way, the idea of folk music, like the people, like not you, the individual, like there was an element in folk music that your kind of individuality was supposed to be kind of muted. And you were supposed to be singing these songs as a kind of tribute to the larger community that they emerged from. Like Dylan was not doing that from the very beginning. Dylan was doing Bob Dylan versions of these songs. I mean, some of which were you know, good, or some of which were not that good, but they were very much him. There is a house down in New Orleans. They call the rising sun. And it's been of many poor girls and me oh god i'm a one he's astonishingly better than almost everything else around him. people say he can't sing i think that dylan was until very recently when his voice really started to give out a great singer in about a dozen different modes, and you listen to that early stuff and you hear humor and imagination and a sense of possibility, and a sense that he really admires these songs he's singing, but that doesn't mean he's their slave or that he wants to replicate them. He wants to own them. He wants to take these things he loves and make them better as he makes them his. I was born in Dixie in a boomer shack Just a little shanty by the railroad track Freight train was all taught me how to cry Home another drive was another life I I got the freight train blue <laughs> Dylan at this point is the most incredible sponge and I don't use that in a derogatory uh, uh, sense because uh, you only ever learn anything by being a sponge and soaking everything up. And uh, he has soaked all this up as a performer. And then you've got his two first recorded compositions on there, the best of which is his homage to Woody Guthrie, which is heartfelt 
and already probably streets ahead of the songs that anybody else was writing at this time. Hey, hey, Woody Guthrie, I wrote you a song About a funny old world that's a-coming along Seems sick and it's hungry, it's tired and it's torn It looks like it's a-dying and it's hardly been born you know, in retrospect, it's completely unsurprising and unremarkable that Robert Shelton should have walked into Gertie's and said, holy mackerel, I like folk music, but then there's this, <laughs> you know? He changed everything. And I'm just talking about musically now, which is supposed to be where he isn't, where he doesn't have much of a voice and all of that crapola. We're not talking about the songwriting, which ultimately he's also the person who instigates that. I mean, there are exceptions. There are other people writing their own songs by then, but not like Dylan. And Dylan's own songwriting output began to develop at a prodigious rate after the recording of his debut. Although he was composing occasional songs while back on the Minneapolis scene, his immersion in the Greenwich Village folk world fully liberated his creativity. And by January 1962, on the back of the new material he was producing, John Hammond secured Dylan his first music publishing deal. This led to the recording of a seven-track demo, which collected together songs that the artist had mostly penned during the previous year. I think the early Bob Dylan songs, I mean, there's only two on his debut album, uh, and, you know, I wouldn't have put money on him being the spokesman of a generation on that evidence. But, I mean, he was writing prolific, he was churning stuff out, um, you know, on, on beer mats, on napkins, on envelopes. I mean, he was just churning this stuff out. and. A lot of the early Dylan compositions were his lyrics to existing tunes. I mean, uh, Hard Times in New York Town came from a, a 30 song called uh, Down on Penny's Farm. Um, Rambling Gambling, Willie K. The tune was from Brennan on the Moor by, by the Clancy Brothers and uh, Tommy Makem, who Dylan would have seen around Greenwich Village at the time. Oh, New York City is a friendly old town From Washington Heights to Harlem on down There's a mighty many people in the middle and all around They'll kick you when you're up and knock you when you're down It's hard times from the country Living down in New York town Well, the weak and the strong and the rich and the poor Together, together Yet where this early material lyrically conformed to either semi-autobiographical folk or traditional blues forms, by the end of January 62, Dylan's prolific pen turned unexpectedly towards contemporary protest songs. This shift in subject matter was not only traceable to the times themselves, but also to Dylan's girlfriend during this period, Suze Rotolo, who had moved into the singer-songwriter's apartment at the start of the year. When Dylan met Suze Rotolo, she was 17 years old, but she came from this radical American-Italian family. Her sister, Carla was working for Alan Lomax, so that opened certain doors. And Suze was, uh, you know, full-on radical political activist. She was working for the uh, campaign of racial equality. She was involved in anti-nuclear protests. She was picketing Woolworths in Manhattan because their branches in the South had segregated lunch counters. I mean, I think Dylan himself admitted that she was there before he was in terms of this, uh, this world of radical protest. There's been rumours of war and wars that have been. The meaning of life has been lost in the wind. And some people thinking that the end is close by. Instead of learning to live, they are learning to die. Let me die in my footsteps before I go down under the ground. Bob, you know, he was informed by a lot of his left-wing friends. You know, that's what Susie Rodolo and people like that. His girlfriend in uh, the a circle. Um, Albert Mayer, I think, is, and there was a few people that really influenced him politically, because I don't think that was his number one agenda, but, you know, he'd hear about all these outrages and these injustices, and he had the ability to extemporate, um, well, I, how should I say, extrapolate from 
what he's what he had heard and these things, this kind of whole the, these vistas that had been shown to him, and he was able to it was material to write. Whether he was really po political, um, I don't know if I could say that, but um, he he could pin down a prompt, pin, point it, pin it down, and point it out, and in beautiful, po powerfully poetical ways. There's always been people that have to cause fear. They've been talking about a war now for many long years. I've read all their statements and I've not said a word. But now, Lord God, let my poor voice be heard. Let me die in my He had an innate talent for writing songs and seeing what's going on around him. So at that time, he could write about poor people, people being starved, people being killed. So he was following the trend, so to speak, but he still made the trend better than it was. And I've always felt that. He was always interested in working his own career, his own music. And I'm not saying it's bad. You know, he, he did a good job with all the songs, just about all of the songs. He wrote more good songs, I think, than anyone I've ever heard before. Twas down in Mississippi Not so long ago When a young boy from Chicago town Stepped through a southern door This boy's fateful tragedy I can still remember well The color of his skin was black, and his name was Emmett Till. If you look at something like the Ballad of Emmett Till, it's quite a trite treatment of what was certainly not a trite subject. Um, there's this, this black kid who uh, had dared to look at a, 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 a white woman who'd been killed and tossed in the Tallahassee River, which was already quite an old story by the time Dylan commemorates it in song. I think it happened back in 1955. I think the song ends with a, a line, something about um, you know making this great land of ours a greater place to live. You know, it, it's it, it's a worthy but a banal sentiment, uh, which he would very soon eradicate from his writing. When he us folks that thinks alike. If we'd give all we could give, we'd make this great land of ours a greater place to live. You look at these early songs, and if he was a great poet, you'd say they were the juvenilia of his work. But it's the speed at which um, he transcends being an imitator to being a, a a genuinely new and unique voice that is the most impressive thing about Dylan at this period. This focus on contemporary issues brought Dylan directly into the orbit of one of the elder statesmen of the folk world. Despite only narrowly avoiding prison time following his appearance before the House Un-American Activities Committee, Pete Seeger had remained a prominent activist, closely associated with both the campaign for nuclear disarmament and the growing civil rights movement. In February 1962, with fellow folk singer Sis Cunningham and her husband Gordon Friesen, he founded Broadside, a magazine that would feature contemporary folk songs. Having heard his new material, Seeger was keen to bring Dylan on board for the first issue, and over the next two years, the young singer-songwriter would become the magazine's most regular contributor. Broadside was openly leftist, not communist, but leftist, and they got a lot of the best songs that were written at the time, and a lot of lousy songs too, <laughs> because uh, they were getting songs, you know, eight or ten songs in every number, and sometimes getting them a month apart. I don't know how they did it. That was a, lab a real labor of love. It was really nitty gritty. It was a workers, left wing worker type approach to everything. 
they would print songs like from my song Thirsty Boots to the blowing in the wind or I ain't marching anymore to like somebody complaining about the landlord or there's the, the water's leaking in my kitchen or the cockroaches are out of control. I mean, they printed everything. It was very egalitarian in terms and democratic in terms of the kind of material. The school teacher, they didn't have enough heat in the room, so they, she'd write a song about that. It was up for grabs. Everybody could write a song. Everybody had a song on them, like Merle Haggard said, you know, every single person on, walks the face of the earth has at least one great song on them. And uh, that, they went out to prove it. <laughs> if Dylan would soon prove that he had a staggering number of great songs in him, a new composition that he penned in April 62 was quickly recognized as both his first major work and the first significant original to emerge from the post-rock and roll folk revival blowing in the wind. Yet at an early performance of this track, which would become an anthem for the civil rights movement, he was keen to inform the audience that it was not a protest song. When Dylan said about blowing in the wind, you know, this ain't a protest song, I think that, you know, I think he was beginning to understand the limits of the world that he was moving in, at the same time as he understood what the potential impact of a song like blowing in the wind could be. You know, so that if it's a song you know, kind of torn from the headlines that was about something that happened yesterday, well, tomorrow, it might not be that important. But if it's a song that kind of is elevated uh, into something a little more universal than that, while taking energy from what's happening in the headlines, you know, I think that's the sweet spot that Dylan hit. How many years must a mountain exist before it is washed to the sea? Yes, and how many years can some people exist before they're allowed to be free? Yes, and how many times must a man turn his head and pretend that he just doesn't see? The answer, my friend, is a blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing. There are no specifics in blowing in the wind. It's like we shall overcome, you know, it's, it's an anthem that, uh, I mean, I don't suppose Dylan was actually thinking at the time he wrote it, people will still be singing this in 60 years time, but, uh, but they are, and you can, you can easily see why, because he's distilled something universal, something that uh, transcends the, the, the specific and the particular. And this is where the whole problem that he will subsequently have with being the voice of a generation begins. In that song, he is casting himself, whether he likes it or not, as the voice of a generation. Although the song did not receive a commercial release in any guise until a year after it was composed, its immediate impact on the folk scene itself was considerable. Attracting attention both as a prominent number in Dylan's own live sets and published in Broadside in May 62, Blowing in the Wind and his other recent output suggested to a number of his peers that original compositions had greater potential than the traditional folk and blues songbook. Seeger wrote songs and Tom Paxson wrote songs, uh, but it was not a done thing until Dylan came along. Dylan kind of signified a, you know, a sea change and all of a sudden you wrote your own song. It was just sort of like automatic as opposed to no one even thought of doing that. And then suddenly, like, everyone didn't, didn't really think of doing that. Just thought, that's what you do. That's how you do it, you know? The song also attracted the attention of impresario Albert Grossman, who not only secured Dylan a new publishing contract on the back of it, but also signed on as his manager shortly after. Throughout the remainder of 1962, Dylan continued to write new material and recorded several sessions for his second album, and by the close of the year, he took his first trip across the Atlantic, traveling to London for a TV performance. During his brief visit, he quickly immersed himself in the city's own thriving folk scene, soaking up whatever he could from a homegrown musical tradition that stretched back to the late medieval era. He came over to do a play for the BBC called Madhouse on Castle Street. And whenever any of his charges came over, his manager, who was Albert Grossman, would, uh, would bring him around the folk clubs, because there were quite a few cl folk clubs around, and uh, I was in a, we called, them, we called them groups in those days. I was in a group called the Thameside Four, 
and we ran a club um, in a place called the King and Queen in Foley Street, right by the Middlesex Hospital. And he came there and he, he walked in the door and I recognised him because uh, there's a place called Collett's Record Shop on you know, New Oxford Street, which was the, the folk record shop. And they had this American magazine called Sing Out. His picture had been on the front and they printed an interview and three of his songs. They printed Song to Woody, Masters of War, and I think they printed Blowing in the Wind. I think they think that was in that one. It was obviously, you know, a big fuss was being made about him. And there was that face that had been on the front of Sing Out. So I went over and asked him if he wanted to sing. And he said, ask me later. So I asked him later and he got up and sang. He was just a fabulous performer. Absolutely fabulous performer. Completely in charge. But then us English people were used to Americans being good performers. I think it must be something they do in school. And, um, but he was just a bit better than pretty good. He was extremely good. And he came down to various other clubs that I was, I was either performing in or was around. And his repertoire was just fascinating, was, was, was beautiful. As impressive as Dylan's repertoire was, it mainly consisted of traditional American folk songs. Yet through Martin Carthy and the other musicians on the London circuit, he was exposed to a new catalogue of material that he could adapt and interpret. This would have a profound influence on his development as a songwriter. We happened to get on really well, you know, became quite matey. But when it comes down to it, he was hearing an awful lot of other people. He heard a guy, a Scots guy called Nigel Denver. He heard a guy who's still around called Bob Davenport. He heard, you know, he heard loads and loads of people, Enoch Kent, all these singers who were around in, in, uh, <clears throat> in London at the time. And they all had a huge effect on him. I don't think that ever enough attention has been paid to the change that occurred to his writing after he came to England. He'd half recorded Free Wheel and Bob Dylan, and he finished it when he got back. And one of the songs he wrote, either during or after, was Girl from the North Country, certainly, because that's based on Scarborough Fair, which I used to sing, um, and um, Bob Dylan's Dream. If you're travelling in the North Country fast By the winds hit heavy on the borderline Once was a true love of mine. If you go in the snowflake storm, when the rivers freeze on summer ends. He wrote songs around traditional songs. I wasn't the only person he learned from. He just learned, I mean, he was a piece of blotting paper. Upon his return to New York in January 1963, and armed with this new batch of compositions, Dylan re-entered Columbia Studios to continue work on his sophomore LP, eventually recording over 30 tracks for possible inclusion on the album. Issued in May 1963, The Free Wheel in Bob Dylan was a landmark release, featuring almost exclusively original material, and it signalled a watershed not only for the young singer-songwriter from Hibbing, but also for the folk revival and for popular music itself. The Free Wheel and Bob Dylan was very important, beginning with its cover. I mean, the cover became a kind of iconic image of that period. This kind of young, folky couple, Dylan and Susie Rotola, walking down Jones Street in Greenwich Village. They're kind of huddling together. It just kind of caught that kind of romantic, you know, beleaguered, uh, idealistic vision of you know, kind of young people on the folk scene at that time. Then, of course, the album itself made a massive impact. Just these amazing songs that announced a very dramatic new talent. Well, it ain't no use sitting and wonder why, baby. Even you don't know by now. And it ain't no use to sit and wonder why, baby. It'll never do somehow When your rooster crows at the break of dawn Look out your window and I'll be gone You're the reason I'm traveling on But don't think twice, it's all right 
Free Wheel, in, in my opinion, is a truly great record. And in part, that's because he sings Corinna, Corinna, and and uh, and uh, as does Don't Think Twice, It's All Right, which is but no protest song, just one of the greatest love songs or whatever it is ever written. Even for Dylan, the songs on that record are of exceptional quality and the performance is remarkable. Even for Dylan, who was to make a lot of other great records, but that's certainly one of them. Collecting together both plaintive love ballads and his most recent protest material, the original songs on the record indicated that Dylan had quickly ascended to the top of the new folk revival. Where contemporaries such as Phil Oakes, Fred Neal and Eric Anderson were all performing their own compositions by the time of the album's release, and Tom Paxton had been doing so since the dawn of the 1960s, Dylan's work was expanding the possibilities of the folk form itself. It's a lesson too late for the learning Made of sand, made of sand In the wink of an eye my soul is turning In your hand, in your hand The word other singers in Greenwich Village writing their own material but did any of these people write A Hard Rain's Gonna Fall? Did they write Oxford Town or did they write Masters of War? No. What Dylan did was totally new and unique and original. And what do you do now, my blue eyes, And what do you do now, my darling young one? I'm going back out for the rain starts to fall in. I head for the depths of the deepest dark forest Where the people are many and the hands are all empty Where the pellets of poison are flooding their waters And I tell it and think it and speak it and breathe it And reflect from the mountains so all souls can see it if you listen to that song, it has very folk elements. I mean, you know, it takes lines from traditional folk songs and takes a ballad format, that question and answer format. You know, where have you been, my blue-eyed son? Where have you been, my darling young one? And then the answer comes and then, you know, another question and another answer and another question and another answer. But when you look, so the, the ballad form is, is perfectly intact. It's a kind of classic example of it. But if you look at the lyrics, the answers to those questions are this wild kind of like beat inspired to torrent of images, you know, that is really nothing like traditional folk music. And it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard rain. Gonna fall. That was kind of conveniently ignored at the time, I think. You know, the song was really uh, going in directions aesthetically that I don't think anybody wanted to think too much about what the implications of that were. I'm your masters of war. Here that build the big guns. Here that build the death planes. Here that build all the bombs Here that hide behind walls Here that hide behind discs I just don't want you to know I can see through your masks The anger from early on you seemed to single him out from his contemporaries. I mean, the, 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 even the Phil Oakes protest songs are quite polite. The Paxton stuff is, is quite gentle. Even though a song like Lyndon Johnson Told the Nation, which is a very, very early anti-Vietnam song, at a time when, when Johnson was seen as, you know, a, a doing truly great work in the Civil Rights Bill, you know, criticising him was seen as quite a controversial thing. Um, you know, Paxton was, was not afraid of pulling punches, but he sounded quite polite about it. Red Dylan always sounded quite angry. You must say that I'm young. You might say I'm unlearned But there's a one thing I know I'm younger than you 
Even Jesus would never forgive what you do. Dylan recognised that this protest movement that, that Suze Rotello had brought him into was uh, a fight to the death, if you like. You know, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a subject for the Kingston Trio and Peter, Paul and Mary to, or even Pete Seeger to sing prettily about. So it required that level of uh, vitriol and venom that you hear in a song like Masters of War when you know he says and i hope that you die and your death will come soon i will follow your casket on a pale afternoon nobody not even woody guthrie i don't think had written with this kind of uh, emotional vituperation before so we are seeing something totally new and unique the free wheel in lp drew instant attention to dylan upon its release the wider music press recognising that the singer-songwriter represented a new breed of folk artist. His stock was raised even higher when a cover version of lead track Blowin' in the Wind was issued within weeks of the album by pop folk trio Peter, Paul and Mary, a manufactured act concocted by Dylan's manager, Albert Grossman. The single rapidly climbed to number two on the Billboard chart and introduced Dylan's work into the mainstream. Dylan's voice, I love his voice. I think he's one of the most expressive singers in the world and with great phrasing and he's actually always really on pitch but you'd have to say it would be an acquired taste for a lot of people you know peter paul and mary had a more homogenized and kind of airbrushed whitewashed version the song is brilliant and stands up on its own i mean no matter who would be singing it but they just made a more accessible user-friendly version. How many times must the cannonballs fly before they're forever banned? The answer, my friend, is blowing in the wind. The answer is blowing in the wind. It spread word of who he was, but you know, the fact that it was a pop hit, I don't think that the people who propelled that song into the pop top 10 thought very much about who wrote it. I think they thought it was a good tune with a nice lyric. I, I, I think it would be a mistake to believe that it made him a star in itself, except insofar as it attracted the press, because he really began to get press then. Uh, and that was an important factor, and I'm sure that Blown in the Wind by Peter, Paul, and Mary was an important aspect of that. Yet even more significant in raising Dylan's profile, both within the folk community itself and in the national press, was his endorsement by the most prominent figure on the entire scene, Joan Byers. Then at the height of her fame, with two albums in the chart and an appearance on the cover of Time magazine the previous year, Byers first performed with Dylan in May 1963 at the Monterey Folk Festival. It was at the second Newport Folk Festival in the July, however, that she made the young singer-songwriter the star of the show and their subsequent relationship further thrust Dylan into the spotlight. Joan Baez is already a star. Um, it's not hard to see why, really. I mean, she had this pure, almost operatic voice. I mean, she looked like this sort of unearthly, angelic being. You can't underestimate her significance on the folk scene at this point. There's a middle-class quality there. There's a purity to the voice, the sort of slightly operatic style of delivery. It's, it's the high art end of folk music. It's not the, the scruffy hobos riding a train with a guitar strapped on their back. So this is acceptable in uh, Carnegie Hall and New York Town Hall and these great halls of high culture. Dylan, in his autobiography, Chronicles, writes about, uh, having said some very cruel things about her over the years, 
Finally, he puts the record straight in, in Chronicles and uh, says that he was pretty much in, not only in awe of her, but that, you know, she was only six months or so older than him, but she seemed so much further down the road as a, an accomplished performer and an established star that uh, he actually says that she made him feel completely useless. They became this kind of romantic couple you know, it was possible to see them as the kind of king and queen of folk music, you know, and that was, that imagery was very important to Dylan. You know, I mean, Joan Baez was already huge. I mean, she was a massive star, but her giving Dylan, uh, you know, two or three songs at various performances, his opening for her, his coming out and singing with her on stage, you know, that was huge. This is a ballad of sorts. Uh, it tells a story if you, <laughs> if you like stories. <laughs> wow. Maybe it doesn't tell a story. <laughs> After years of Dylan's kind of irascibility, it's really hard to recover just how charming he was back in those days. There was this kind of impish quality that he had and just seemed to delight in the attention and delight in Joan Baez's affection for him and, you know, delight in bringing his songs to people. There was a lot of humor in his songs and in his presentation and a kind of twinkle in his eye that I think you know, made audiences feel good. But I can't think for you, you have to decide whether Judas Iscariot had God on his side. Dylan needed guidance. You know, he needed something. He was beginning to get this level of attention, you know. You know, in his small world of Greenwich Village, you know, he was already a star. You know, he learned what it is to play in front of a big audience and how you do that. And, you know, he learned under the guidance of someone who genuinely loved him and appreciated him as a writer and an artist and wanted the best for him. About as much coverage as the media could muster for it back in those days, they mustered for it. And if you were interested in music or folk music or even politics, you know, you pretty soon knew who Bob Dylan was because of, uh, you know, his relationship with Joan Baez. Dylan was now part of the folk aristocracy, his songs becoming fixtures on the repertoires of both established and aspirant musicians across America, as well as prominent protest anthems. The civil rights movement in particular adopted Blowing in the Wind, and unlike in the early to mid-1950s, when its leftist political allegiances essentially sent the folk scene underground, a decade later, things had changed. The state-sanctioned racial discrimination of the Jim Crow laws in the American South had become one of the key domestic issues of the era. And with President John F. Kennedy's administration itself actively opposing segregation, the folkies' politics seemed to chime with a growing desire for widespread social change. The Greenwich Village musicians themselves not only composed material about the injustices being enacted by the establishment of the South, but also joined the front lines of this conflict to support the cause of disenfranchised African Americans. The one thing, at least can get the people to vote, give them at least a fighting chance. So I went down to Mississippi and with Jack Newfield, who was a writer for The Village Voice, and we stayed with black people, this guy named Steptoe. And when you were down there, and you, boy, you see a full moon going through the mist, and you're driving down Highway you know, Route 66 going down, it's like, you know, you felt like it was scary land. I'd rather sleep with a, with a gator than run into one of these rednecks. This is a place not one person registered to vote. And Steptoe, he was trying to rally to get on. He wasn't afraid. He was trying to get people to vote. People were scared. I mean, very scared. Because the week before, somebody got shot down at the mill. You know, just like a mile away. Jack Newfield, he got shot at, you know, for hanging up signs. 
I went into a drugstore, you know, an Apotec place to buy toothpaste. I didn't even open my mouth. I walk up to pay, didn't say a word. And the lady, the lady kind of says, and what part of New York are you all from? You know, high, you just want to hightail it out of there and run into the woods. Yet until 1963, Dylan himself had had little involvement in political activism. His new partner, Joan Byers, however, like Pete Seeger before her, had been a notable participant in marches and demonstrations since the late 1950s. In the months following the Newport Festival, Dylan's presence at political events increased, first making an appearance at a registration rally in Mississippi with Pete Seeger, and on August the 28th, 1963, performing alongside Byers at the historic Great March on Washington. Yet these were isolated events, and despite his peerless ability to articulate pressing social issues in song, Dylan favored writing over marching. One of the reasons why Dylan emerged out of that scene so powerfully is that he saw politics as a subject. He didn't see it as like, you know, I believe this with every core of my being. He saw it as something to write about. And he went to demonstrations and he performed, and I, I don't mean to take that away from him, but I think he understood it as a writer. He understood it as an artist. Whereas artistry was not something, I mean, you weren't even supposed to talk about artistry on the folk scene for the most part. It was supposed to be, again, like something that naturally emerged from, you know, the, the people. But, you know, Dylan was an artist, you know, and that's, you know, I think he was able to render those issues in as compelling a way as he did because he saw them in artistic terms. Yet even if his activities themselves were limited, as a songwriter, his work had made him a luminary of the left. And between August and October 1963, with the folk scene at the height of its cultural significance, Dylan entered the studio to record the defining work of the protest movement, The Times They Are A-Changing. If your time to you is worth saving, then you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone for the times they are a-changing. It is from the outside in, I mean, it, it's very much the folk protest album of its time. Even today, um, you listen to, you know, your sons and your daughters are beyond your command, you know, and the old, you know, all this stuff just, just seemed to resonate in, in, in uh, when it came out, on its release. And then you had songs like With God on Our Side, which you know, nobody had ever heard before. I mean, remarkably mature song for someone who was, what, 22 when he wrote it. So now as I'm leaving, I'm weary as hell. The confusion I'm feeling ain't no tongue can tell. The words fill my head and fall to the floor. That if God is our The Times They Are Changing is the ultimate protest album. It's everything that freewheeling was and more. The songwriting has reached a further level of sophistication. Uh, the anger is still there. Uh, I think the timing and poise as a performer is still growing. The songs themselves are the greatest protest songs ever written. Some of them are very specific. Some of them like the title track, of course, are uh, like blowing in the wind, built on that universal vernacular theme. But then you've got songs like um, Lonesome Death of Hattie Carroll uh, and Only a Pawn in Their Game that, that refer to very specific events. William's Lansing, I killed poor Hattie Carroll With a cane that he twirled around his diamond ring finger At a Baltimore hotel, society gathering and the cops were called in and his weapon took from him as they rode him in custody down to the station and booked Williams and Zinger for first degree murder and you who philosophize disgrace and criticize our fears take the rug away from your face 
Now ain't the time for your tears. But here's the difference. By this time, Dylan's artistry is so finely attuned that whereas we probably are not going to listen to the ballad of Emmett till now, and we see that as a song that was of its time, it was about a racist atrocity in the 1950s, you know, you can listen to The Lonesome Death of Hattie Carroll and you can listen to Only a Paul in Their Game today, and even though the events they describe are quite specific and particular and took place half a century ago, they still have this enormous power and potency. I wasn't particularly tuned in to the faction that were singing topical songs, so I didn't spend a lot of time listening to it. I was rehearsing with uh, Annie Bird at the third side. Her boyfriend let us sit there during the day and rehearse. The place was closed, and Bob came by and so we were there and knocked on the window and we let him in and he had cut his finger and he was all concerned because he said, man, I have a gig tonight. I don't, I don't know if I'm going to be able to play. So we took him in the back and, and, you know, cleaned it up, put a bandage on it, made him some coffee and we're sitting there on some crates in this funky kitchen of this little folk club and he started playing only a pawn in their game. A bullet from the back of a bush took Medgar Evers' blood. A finger fired the trigger to his name. A handle hit out in the dark. A hand sent the spark. Two eyes took the aim behind a man's brain. But he can't be blamed He's only a pawn in that game And right in that moment I had an epiphany. It was like a light bulb went off. It, because previous to that, hearing that song, most of the protest songs and the, it, were very polemic and they were very self-righteous and uh, b besides being musically boring they were they were oh the rednecks are so terrible because they hate the negro and they're so wrong and we're so right and you know it just wasn't my thing to listen to but this song there was such a cosmic overview that he showed in that song where where he instead of blaming the poor white redneck who was uh, attacking the black people in the South. He he saw them as a pa also a pawn in a larger game. I just saw it as such a cosmic overview that my opinion of his music changed drastically in that moment, and I've been a huge fan ever since because that's the kind of song that really moves people in the end. The deputy sheriffs, the soldiers, the governors get paid. And the marshals and cops get the same. But the poor white man's used in the hands of them all like a tool. He's taught in his school from the start by the rule that the laws are with him to protect his white skin, to keep up his hate, so he never thinks straight about the shape that he's in, so it ain't him to blame. He's only a pawn in that game. There's no song illustrates better how Dylan is just streets ahead of the competition than only a pawn in their game. Phil Oakes writes about the same story the murder of the civil rights activist, Medgar Evers. Phil Oakes does it like a newspaper report, which is fine, and there's a, a rich and uh, worthy tradition of folk song being the journalism of its time set to music. His name was Medgar Evers, and he walked his road alone, like Emmett Till and thousands more whose names we'll never know. They tried to burn his home and they beat him to the ground But deep inside they both knew what it took to bring him down Too many martyrs and too many dead 
But look at the way Dylan tackles the Medgar Evers story. He just turns the whole thing on its head. It's not just about, you know, some white racist cracker pointing a gun and killing a civil rights leader. He turns it into a commentary and an analysis of the entire social structure that has created this situation, how it came about. Phil Oakes ends up his song saying something like, the, the country gained a killer and lost a man, which is just banal. Dylan says, yeah, but hang on, who is this character who fired the gun? You've got to look at what lies behind that. And you've got to look at the whole edifice of state governors and marshals and sheriffs and cops that have created and support and sustain uh, this system of Jim Crow laws and, and, and allows these injustices to be perpetrated. The increasing desire for significant political and social change that Dylan articulated on the album, and which resonated particularly among the younger generation, was in part a result of a new optimism in America. Since Kennedy took office, the country had entered a period of unprecedented economic growth, and although the threat of nuclear war with the Soviet Union loomed large during this period, the young president seemed to represent a new era of peace, both domestically and internationally. This optimism was shattered, however, on November the 22nd, 1963. I think the assassination of JFK uh, scared the shit out of Dylan, if I'm allowed to say that. That they could gun down in broad daylight, they, whoever they are, uh, the President of the United States, um, it must have been running through his mind. I'm being called the voice of a generation. I'm being put up there as a spokesman. I'm singing all these radical songs. You know, I'm attacking the whole racist infrastructure of American society. If they can shoot the president in broad daylight, what are they gonna do to me one dark night when I step out of the stage door of a club where I've just sang these songs that were gonna drive them absolutely mad into some dark alley? He certainly started contemplating where all of this might end up. And it's at this point, I think, you can trace the beginnings of a more elusive Dylan, someone who is going to protect himself. There is you know, a real fear there that um, plays over into both the songs and the way he conducts and bears himself. Uh, and in fact, the outcome of that is he moves on to a, a, a whole new level of, of creativity and expression. And so it, it's, it's enormously positive. Even before Kennedy's assassination, Dylan's creative urges had already been directing him away from folk traditions and the protest form. During the latter half of 63, he had begun to read obsessively, focusing both on the Bible and the works of the French symbolist poets. And these literary influences inspired him to begin writing free-form prose and poetry of his own. In December, he met beat poet Allen Ginsberg for the first time, and the pair struck up a close friendship, and rapidly Dylan's focus shifted from political to aesthetic concepts and ideas. And although he was initially investigating new approaches to content, in 1964, a revolution occurred that made him reevaluate musical form. The coming of the Beatles and the British invasion reawakened the dormant rock and roller in not only Bob Dylan, but a large number of other Greenwich Village artists who had abandoned electricity in the late 1950s. It would change everything. Cool people didn't admit to liking rock and roll for a long time. Something happened to pop music uh, about in 1962. You had Carole King, you had Phil Spector, you had all these awesome girl groups. You had the Beach Boys suddenly, uh, the Stones form, the Beatles get their first uh, hit. Obviously, like the music had come back with a vengeance. Me. 
on one hand, a lot of people realized that they were something special and something really good. On the other hand, uh, a lot of people said, you know, that's not music, that's just noise. They, they wave their hair and they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. What happens in English rock is essentially an America-loving rock and roll phenomenon. Here, I, the only thing you can say about the great rock, American rock groups of the, of the late 60s um, is that uh, the, the chief feeder for that world was the folk world. Janis Joplin was a folky. Um, obviously, the Birds and John Sebastian and John Phillips were folkies. Jerry Garcia of the Grateful Dead was a folky. Marty Balin was a folky. Grace Slick was a folky. On and on and on. What the Beatles really do is they open up the aesthetic of those people, many of whom it seems to me were not purists at all, that this was where the action was. They went to it. They listened to their Harry Smith. In some cases, they certainly learned their guitar picking moves. Then they said, oh, well, there's more to life than this. I like the Beatles, too. Uh, and they started doing it in their own way. The Beatles were obviously turning pop music on its head. I mean, there are stories that Dylan is going around Greenwich Village in the early days of the Beatles saying, ah, it's just bubblegum. But I think he quickly realises uh, there's, there's more to it than that. Um, I think there's one particularly significant moment which... Uh, doesn't involve the Beatles, but is part of the British invasion. And that is when he hears Eric Burden and the Animals version of um, House of the Rising Sun. There is a house in New Orleans. They call the rising sun. It's clearly based on his version of the song on his first album, which he in turn, of course, had nicked from, from Dave Van Ronk, but that's the nature of folk music. But he hears his song, as he's come to see it, reinvented by these guys from Newcastle in little old England, and they've put this organ on it and this bass and these drums. House of the Rising Sun by the Animals, you could make out a case that this is actually the first folk rock record. Dylan hears this, and uh, I think that possibly is at least as significant as the influence of the Beatles on him. When Dylan returned to the studio in June 1964, that influence wasn't directly apparent on the album that resulted, save for some small musical motifs referencing the Beatles' work. Yet another side of Bob Dylan, recorded in a single night, presented a very different artist to the archetypal protest singer of his previous release. Gone were the finger-pointing songs, highlighting injustices, and gone too were the references to political and social change, replaced by a more introspective focus and a diffuse symbolist style. Upon its release in August 64, the album proved a commercial disappointment, and it received heavy criticism from some in the folk press, who considered that for the celebrated voice of a generation, it was an abdication from duty. Erwin Silber, wrote a piece at that time to say that somehow Bob Dylan had lost uh, contact with his audience. And I think that's completely and absolutely wrong. I don't think he'd lost contact with his audience. I think he'd found himself and was writing songs for himself, songs that were not necessarily influenced by other people.
Bob's rejection of the folk protest movement is, is summed up on several songs on there. My Back Pages, where he literally says, I was so much older then, I'm younger than that now. And also It Ain't Me Babe, which is clearly a song that's about relationships. But so many of Bob's songs have got two meanings, and It Ain't Me Babe could definitely be looked at as also him addressing the, uh, the folk protest movement at the time. Go away from my window Leave at your own chosen speed I'm not the one you want, babe I'm not the one you need You say you're looking for someone Who's never weak but always strong to protect you and defend you Whether you are right or wrong Someone to open each and every door But it ain't me, babe No, 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 it ain't me, babe It ain't me you're looking for, babe People thought that Politics was the important thing, and folk music was a way to like, like, like help it along. Whereas, like, like, music is the thing, and politics is, is this kind of like, like, creepy little thing that's trying to crawl on the back of this wonderful beast, you know. When Dylan did another side of Bob Dylan, like a lot of people got offended by the fact that he wasn't doing this political stuff anymore. And I thought, like, finally, he's got it. Now he's got it. Now you know. Now, now he's really doing it. Was was was, was my take. You know, like, like, his music just took a, a giant step as of that album. For whatever reasons, the protest elements are largely absent. Uh, where they are present, they've taken on a new, deeper form. I'm thinking of a song like Chimes of Freedom, which personally I would still characterise as a protest song, but it's, it's clearly a very different kind of protest song from something like The Lonesome Death of Hattie Carroll or Only a Pawn in Their Game. Far between the finish sundown and midnight's broken toe, we ducked inside the doorway as thunder went crashing. As majestic bells of bolts struck shadows in the sounds, seeming to be the chime of freedom flashing. Another side of Bob Dylan, I think there's two strands to it. I think one is that it, it is, in a sense, his adieu to the, to, the, to the folk movement. I think that was addressed on Restless Farewell, the closed Times They Are A Changing album. You know, he was moving on. I think that's, that's, that's one element. There are certain themes and, and keys and certain lines that you can pick out from songs on that another side of record that, that would seem to be Dylan distancing himself from the folk movement. But also, I think it's him champing at the bit and wanting to go electric. I think you, you, can, you can imagine electric instrumentation, certainly on It Ain't Me, Babe, if he'd sobered up a bit on All I Really Want to Do. There, there are certain songs you could imagine the animals or, or two guitars, bass and drums backing him on. So I think, I think it's him, I think he's very restless on it. I think, you know, it's recorded in one night. I, don't know, I kind of get the feeling he, he was kind of bored with the whole thing and he wanted to do something very, very different. And I think that probably meant leaving the folk movement behind and also going electric. Yet Dylan's withdrawal from the scene was not immediate, nor had his crown slipped at all when he performed at Newport in July 1964, despite the new material betraying his other side. And one song in particular that he unveiled at the festival and which had been recorded but not included on his latest album provided a true indication of the quantum leap that Dylan was making creatively. Though I know that evenings 
empire has returned into sand Vanished from my hand Left me blindly here to stand But still not sleeping My weariness amazes me I am branded on my feet I have no one to meet And the ancient empty streets Too dead for dreaming To me, it's, it's his greatest song. I think it's 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 my all-time favourite song. Um, I think there is something truly majestic about it, and I think it is is proof positive of, of Bob Dylan as a, as a poet. There is something just transcendent about that song, and, and it takes popular song to a whole different level. And again, you know, youth. He was what twenty four when he wrote it. Hey. Mr. Tambourine Man, play a song for me In the jingle jangle morning I come following you Mr. Tambourine Man is one of the great landmarks in songwriting. Dylan has already done it several times in, in his young life at this stage, but he does it again here. He actually expands the vocabulary of what you can say in a song. Um, and this is where, you know, the symbolist poet really emerges in Excelsis. Yet the true transformation and the withdrawal from the folk movement was still to come, and Dylan initially proceeded with caution. When in January 1965, he entered the studio to begin sessions for a new album, he recorded solo as always. Yet the tracks he completed on the first day would be immediately discarded, and the following day he returned with a full electric band. During the same week on the west coast of America, a group containing three folk musicians also went into the studio to record a cover version of Mr. Tambourine Man, fusing the sound of the Beatles with the lyrics of Dylan. When Bringing It All Back Home was released in March, followed by the Birds' breakthrough single weeks later, which reached number one in both the US and the UK, popular music was changed forever. Despite a side of acoustic material, there was nothing on Dylan's new album that was even remotely connected to the protest scene he was spearheading only two years beforehand. And having witnessed the impact that the Beatles and the British invasion had made worldwide, he effortlessly jumped out of the political world and landed directly into the heart of pop culture. I think the announcement of Dylan as the hippest creature on earth is subterranean homesick blues which kicks off the electric side of, of uh, bringing it all back home that's that's the that's the, that's the statement that's the announcement John is in a basement mixing up the medicine I'm on a pavement thinking about the government a man in a trench coat batch I laid off says he's got a bad cough wants to get it paid off the guy out here did something you did God knows when but you're doing it again you better duck down Bringing it all back home is, is the shock of the new. And you have to remember at the time, there was a very clear distinction. I mean, folk music offered authenticity and purity, and pop music was vulgar and, and really was left out, was shut out of the room. And by marrying those two together, this was, many saw this as, as a betrayal, that it was Dylan selling out, literally selling out, to, to get commercial success. Oh, get sick, get well. If it is Dylan saying goodbye to, to acoustic music and the folk movement, you wonder why he didn't put the acoustic songs on first and then people might you know, have a slight bit of Bruce Langhorne guitar on side one, then go to side two and have the full impact of, of electric rock and roll. But no, as ever, you know, as ever, Bob did what he wanted to do and it's, he rams it straight in with, with um, subterranean homesick blues and, and then goes on and on and on in this sort of almost electric crescendo. And then it, it is more subdued on side two, but, it, but it's a very different acoustic Dylan. It's not, 
you know, Tambourine Man, Gates of Eden, it's all right, Ma. These, this, this isn't the Bob Dylan of uh, The Ballad of Hollis Brown or uh, The Lonesome Death of Hattie Carroll. Darkness at the break of noon, shadows even the silver spoon, the handmade blade, the child's balloon, eclipses both the sun and moon. To understand, you know, too soon there is no sense in trying. As pointed threats they bluff with scorn, suicide remarks are torn from the fool's gold mouthpiece, the hollow horn plays wasted words, proves to warn that he not busy being born is busy dying. The kind of acoustic songs on Bringing It All Back Home, I think are just monumental. It's hard to find 20 minutes of music as strong as that, you know, 20 minutes of writing that's as strong as that. I mean, that, I mean, those songs are just perfect, as far as I'm concerned. So don't fear if you hear a foreign sound to your ear. It's all right, Ma. I'm only sighing. Among those four songs, I mean, it's really like reading Shakespeare or something, you know, where every single line you know, kind of, kind of is, can be pulled out, you know, take what you have gathered from coincidence. Um, you know, even the president of the United States sometimes must have to stand naked. Um, money doesn't talk, it swears. I mean, like there's, I mean, I mean, you know, if, if, if I could stop and think for a minute, I, I could probably pull out 15 other ones out of those four songs. It's a level of writing that, uh, I don't think anybody else really in rock and pop or folk music for that matter has ever really approached. You must leave now, take what you need, you think will last. But whatever you wish to keep, you'd better grab it fast. He understands your orphan with his gun Crying like a fire in the sun Look out, the saints are coming through And it's all over now, baby blue Dylan essentially was saying to folk artists, you know, I don't care if this bothers you or, you know, this is what I'm doing. And it was, you know, that was the end. It was, you know, it's all over now, baby blue, you know. Uh, you know, you must leave now, take what you need, you think will last. Whatever you wish to keep, you better grab it fast. You know, it, it's, you know, there was a poignancy. And I think, I think Dylan felt that. I think that was genuine, but it was also... There's no turning back now, you know, it's, it's over. It would be a painful separation. In late April 1965, Dylan headed to the UK for a brief tour, accompanied by Albert Grossman and a small entourage, all watched over by the apparently objective lens of filmmaker D.A. Pennebacher. Despite still exclusively performing solo acoustic sets, Dylan was fast becoming a mainstream figure in the UK, thanks in part to his endorsement by the Beatles, and both the press and the public were treating him not like a folk poet, but like a pop star. This newfound fame spread into his life backstage, with crowds of hangers-on attending endless parties fueled by cheap wine and methamphetamine. He had invited Joan Byers along for the tour, yet refused to ask her to join him on stage at any of the shows, and the queen of folk was totally lost within the chaotic hedonism of this new rock and roll lifestyle. Dylan himself began to treat her with mild contempt, a hanger-on from an older scene, incompatible with this new environment. And Byers wasn't alone in feeling the force of his scorn. Alongside the musical development of Bringing It All Back Home, the tour and Penny Backer's subsequent film saw Dylan forming a new, irascible public persona. He was smack in the middle of a phenomenon that has disoriented thousands of other popular geniuses. He was becoming a celebrity. 
It is an impossible thing to get your mind around. And, and people have been saying this for 60 years, and, uh, and, and you look at some of the latest teen pop stars coming out of the Disney factory, and you see exactly the same thing happening. People do not know what to make of it. It's too much. He'd been at the, the top of his game for, God, it was only a couple of years, but I was really feeling the pressure. He said fame is like a million invisible people pressing you against the wall. And you know, everybody wanted a piece of him. Everybody wanted, you know, they, they really felt he had the answers. So, you know, on concert tours and, and in interview, and the fans just want, they wanted the truth from Dylan. And, you know, he was as mixed up as, as anybody. As a character, as a personality, he's changed irrevocably. That's what he leaves behind with the folk world, that, that the, the open Bob Dylan, the Bob Dylan that we see, the impish Bob Dylan we see laughing and joking on stage at uh, Newport in 63. Uh, you know, that, that's where um, perhaps I was so much younger then, he is older than that now. Despite his caustic new persona and his harsh treatment of individuals to whom he had previously been close, Dylan had yet to fully sever his ties with the folk movement itself. Although he had clearly alluded to his withdrawal from the scene in song, it took a personal appearance at Newport in 1965 to drive the message home. He played an acoustic set on July the 24th to a huge audience, apparently the good-humoured performer of the past. Yet with his set the following night, which closed the festival, he emerged with a full band and the event would become legendary. To the dismay of the old guard and to a chorus of boos, in a single show, Dylan broke away from the movement that had nurtured him. Certainly, uh, Bob wanted to make a statement, and uh, to open with Maggie's Farm, that is the ultimate statement. I ain't gonna work on Maggie's Farm no more. I ain't gonna do what people want me to do. I ain't gonna work on Maggie's Farm no more. I ain't gonna work on Maggie's Farm no more. And it's a song that Bob has played a number of times in concert. The original recording that we were able to hear from Newport was pretty damn muddy and covered in feedback. But more recently, it's been available to us in good quality. And it's interesting to me that that performance of Maggie's Farm is probably the strongest that Bob has ever done. Um, that was at the time almost of its birth. I'm, I'm going to make this statement now. And that shows in the performance, it's extremely powerful, and I don't think he's ever bettered it. Well, I try my best to be just like I am, but everybody wants you to be just like them. They say sing while you slave, I just get bored. I ain't gonna work on Maggie's farm no more. Oh. Well, at that time, I thought it was wrong to go over from one thing to the other thing. If he believed in, in electricity, it should have started that way if he was really doing it right. Uh, why didn't he do it? Because uh, there wasn't any real market for it at that time. So uh, <clears throat> that's what I, I say about it. I was there when he uh, became electric uh, at Newport. I was there. I remember when Pete Seeger was so furious and. I was furious and a lot of us, are, you know, we, we got used to something. We thought it was important and uh, the only thing that was important and, you know, Bob Dylan wanted to go that way and so did Phil Oaks. So, you know, you're talking again about, there was an age differential, you know, Pete Seeger and Arthur Lugoff and Harold Leventhal, a lot of people, you know, out there who, who, were, who grew up on, you know, on the old, on the old Coca-Cola, they didn't want the new Coca-Cola, right? I was there when he sang at the Newport Festival, and he came down from the steps there to finish his set, and he said to me, uh, "Where's Pete?" because he knew Pete was upset. And at that point, Pete was in the back somewhere. 
but uh, I said, you do your thing, you know. Now, I've never been the, tr the purest of traditionalists. People went ballistic. It's unimaginative, that's my beef. What happens is that, that, that initially the musicians are in charge and then they all go out on the road and committees take over and committees draw boundary lines. That's my view of it. Uh, and it's hugely generalising it, but that's basically what happens. Um, and the thing gets compartmentalised uh, and you're supposed to stay in your compartment. Well, it's not music. People thought he belonged to them, like because he had written songs, uh, these so-called protest songs, and they, they they thought that Bob belonged to them, and they were outraged the fact that he that they, that they didn't, which is insane. I think insane. It's so reactionary. It's everything that you're against. Those kind of responses. He's now on a very uh, personal journey. This is what great artists do. They don't allow themselves to become specifically aligned with, with a place and time and movement. There has to be space for growth and creative development. So I would see it as a very personal impetus on Dylan's part. Where it becomes problematic and where the animus comes in that develops between him and his old folk crowd, for want of a better term, is that they're outraged that he should want to move on. He's not saying, I'm the Pied Piper, you should all come with me, give up your acoustic guitars and, and pick up an electric guitar and never mind singing folk songs, all become symbolist poets like me. That's not what he's saying at all. He's saying, you know, fine, what you do is valid. He's, he's not invalidating it in any sense whatsoever. He's just saying, that's a phase of my life that I've come through and I'm now moving on somewhere else. Please allow me to, to do so. With Dylan departed, the folk scene was left without its icon. And as an entire youth counterculture emerged across the Western world, Within this new domain of psychedelic drugs, extroverted fashions and progressively louder amplification, the very concept of a folk movement began to seem quaint and outdated. New singer-songwriters emerged over the coming years, yet the emphasis was always on introspection over social commentary. And those artists who had once been Dylan's contemporaries followed his lead in an attempt to progress into this brave new world. Every one of those purists becomes impure. They all start recording with bands. Uh, I mean, many of them continued to uh, uh, hew to their uh, silly romantic solipsism, but, uh, but they do it uh, with a beat or some attempt at a beat and with a cleaner production and a more elaborate instrumentation than had previously been uh, uh, either permissible or in fact affordable in that world. In terms of its cultural centrality, you know, that was over. It would become a niche music, and that happened very fast. It was a form, it was a genre. It was something that you could look into it and make a record that incorporated some of that. But, you know, it was no longer the kind of music of the moment. You know, that, that is what Dylan ended. If the music quickly faded in relevance, conversely, the culture of protest that had been reinforced by the folk movement grew substantially stronger in the late 60s. Yet without a coherent musical scene to hold it together, Greenwich Village itself lost its vitality. Still a centre of bohemian life and artistic activity, it nevertheless became a domain for a number of different subcultures, and many of the folk musicians moved on. A lot of people that had been in New York City wanted to move out of the city for various reasons. You know, the Greenwich Village started to become a theme park of itself. You know, people started coming in from 
from the surrounding areas, New Jersey, the Bronx, Brooklyn, and so forth. And because everything was so, you know, free and easy down there, well, it was well known you could smoke pot and that, you know, you could probably, the gals down there, you could probably get laid, you know, because everything was, you know, free love and all that. So it just became a theme park of itself and very, very crowded. And so, you know, the real artists always can feel that. People moved to the coast. People left. They dispersed. They were making money, getting record deals. I think we kind of outgrew the scene. And also the scene in the village was changing. You know, there was like, Jimi Hendrix came around, the cream played, Frank Zappa had a thing going, you know, the mothers had a thing going. That original simplicity, when the clubs couldn't pay people, and it went, it evolved into on, a, on other levels of entertainment, you know, and, um, Muddy Waters and B.B. King and these, Johnny Winter, they'd bring in these big, there'd be bands, and it was, it was getting more um, sophisticated. And, and, I th and then you realize it was time to move on. It was like our apprenticeship was over, you know, we could go and go on and on. We, what we, we learned it, we, what we had to learn, and go on and, and go on with our lives, and we could practice what we learned. But I mean, all the good that came, you know, on all the writing and all the care, the concern, the risk. In the end, you know, you got Nixon, you got the war went on, you got Reagan, you got George Bush, you got Dick Cheney, you got all these, these beautiful people, these beautiful women. And I mean, you'd have to safely say that the good guys lost. Yet if the progressive political efforts of the era were seemingly thwarted by the brutal dominion of modern, neoconservative capitalism, the music produced during the folk revival has endured. And despite his work in the decades that followed, in which he has drifted in and out of genres, performance styles and even personas, Bob Dylan's output during the 1960s remains not only the highlight of his own career, but one of the key achievements in the entire history of music. You go back and listen to those early folk songs, as I often do. I mean, I have to say, I mean, there was nothing about Dylan going rock and roll that erased the significance of those early songs. But if you go back and listen to those albums, I mean, you will have quite an experience, you know, because that was the trajectory of a hugely important artist out of one hugely important form of music into another. That was the arc of someone who was culturally on fire, not just a major talent, but just kind of riding the rhythms of the zeitgeist with such precision and joy and intensity and force that it's, you know, it's almost hard to absorb it all to this day. <laughs> 